We're talking about residential stormwater management generally when we're talking about containing the rain. What we really want to do is utilize this resource that, um, you know, our our native ecologies, our native environments would have definitely utilized in a different way than we have the opportunity to utilize now. Um, so pre-development, before we had urban areas, before we had suburban areas, even um, agricultural areas in some capacity, there are a lot of different mechanisms in which storm uh, rainwater would essentially infiltrate its way into the ecosystem. So um, we had soils with high organic matter, they would absorb water quickly, we would get some surface runoff, uh, but it would generally go through a lot of vegetation. So it would slow that runoff. Um, it would get into the groundwater. It would be stored in aquifers. The canopies of the trees would intercept a lot of the rainfall and help um, break the velocity in which it would, it would gather on the ground. Uh, our trees and plants also provided a lot of evapotranspiration. So they use the water um, as they're growing and return it to the atmosphere. However, now that we have development, we've introduced a lot of what we call impervious surfaces. And the impervious surfaces have really disrupted that natural water cycle. Um, so now instead of having um, so much vegetation and soils that are really well adapted to infiltrating water, we have less vegetation, we've got more surfaces that won't allow water to infiltrate in any capacity. Um, and we end up with a lot more surface runoff. So that surface runoff can be a problem for, for a number of reasons. A, it becomes accelerated. So we end up with um, a lot of water moving quickly into our streams and rivers um, if we don't have a storm water system or something like that, which causes a lot of erosion and damage to those ecosystems. Also with that high velocity of water, we pick up a lot of sediment, pollutants, uh, potential harmful compounds uh, that we don't want to introduce into our water system, but that high velocity will pick that up very quickly and transport it into our local watershed. Additionally, we're just losing the resource of water that we once had. So, um, you know, we can we can tout all the, the benefits of water. I think that that's pretty self-explanatory. So I don't want to um, go into that too much, but we lose that resource when we're not capturing it. We're not containing it. So when we're talking about contain the rain, we really wanna bring both a solution to the problems that have been caused by the increase in impervious surfaces that we've seen through development, but we also wanna utilize that resource. Water is a valuable resource um, and it's good to be able to hold on to as much as we can. So when we're talking about our opportunities as homeowners, as, as business owners to help contain the rain, we actually have a lot of different tools that we can use. Um, these are all gonna be tools that fight, you know, manage those impervious surfaces. So um, what are some options that we have more broadly? Well, when we have impervious surfaces, like on our roof, we can use things like cisterns and rain barrels to capture that water. Um, we also can plant native trees. Native trees have extensive root systems. They utilize vast amounts of water um, and they're very, very effective at absorbing stormwater runoff and utilizing it and getting it back into our local watershed. Um, again, when you have a tree at full maturity in the middle of summer when it's fully uh, leafed out, it also really slows down the rate that the water hits the soil. So it gives that soil a chance to infiltrate the water instead of allowing it to run off. By having soil that's healthy with a lot of compost in it or a lot of organic material, we can actually increase both our water infiltration rates. So water will enter the soil faster. Our soils will also hold on to water longer. So we increase our water holding capacity of our soils as well. So if we can amend our soils with compost, if we can increase that organic matter in our compost, we actually can use all of our soil around us as a water bank. Um, which will slowly infiltrate and into our watershed, um, which is a much healthier relationship with that water. Additionally, we can put in rain gardens. So rain gardens are generally depressed gardens that uh, will capture rainwater for a period of time and slowly let it infiltrate. Rain gardens have great water holding capacity um, and can really be advantageous 
for slowing that runoff. We also have options like porous pavers or porous concrete. So this is, you know, what we would have traditionally installed with a impervious material. We've now de uh, developed new materials that allow water to infiltrate. So if we're thinking about putting down some sort of hard surface, porous pavers are a really good option. Um, those are some of the main tools that we can use to slow water down. Um, also just having dry creek beds, be, keeping that water from running quickly over our soil surfaces is really, really advantageous for us. So we've got lots of options. It's important as homeowners to think not just about rain, uh, rain barrels, but additionally about a storm management plan in general. Rain barrels are definitely a great tool, but they're not going to capture all the rainwater potential that you have on your property. Um, and other options should be considered as well. Okay. But we're here in the rain barrel workshop and we are considering rain barrels an excellent tool for capturing stormwater. Um, they're generally a low cost option. They provide both stormwater runoff prevention and water as a resource for us. Whereas in some of the applications, we're really just letting that water infiltrate into our, uh, into our watershed. So here we're capturing it, we're able to utilize it. It really makes a great tool for us. So. Let's talk about rain barrels. Okay, here are some major considerations you want to think about before installing a rain barrel or when you're thinking about your stormwater management system, how is this rain barrel going to come into play? So the very first thing you're going to wanna to think about is how much impervious surface do I have that's going to affect how much rainwater I'm going to capture. Um, so an important thing to think about when we're thinking about rain barrels is that we're generally capturing water off of our roofs. We get the gravity, um, it comes down. We've seen other applications of people uh, perhaps pumping water from an impervious surface into a rain barrel um, and doing some other things. But for the most part, we're relying on that impervious surface of our roof, the, the flow of gravity in our downspouts to capture that water. So it makes it a really uh, low tech kind of um, option for us. So what we want to do first is calculate the square footprint or the square footage of our footprint of our roof, not necessarily the surface area. So if you were to go up and calculate, you know, the surface area of your roof with all its peaks and ridges, you would actually get a higher number than just the square footage of your house. Um, so really you just want that, that two dimensional footprint of your house to get that square footage. Um, so another important rule to know is that one square foot receiving one inch of water will generate 0.623 gallons of water. So if we think about a tradition, uh, you know, a, a house that's looking to capture rainwater, we've got about a thousand square foot footprint. In one rain event that has one inch of water, we will generate 623 gallons of water. So as you can see, that is a lot of water. That's a lot more than the general 55 gallon rain barrel can, can contain. Uh, and, and if you're not thinking about your relationship of impervious surface to your capacity of your system, uh, you might run into trouble. You might run into an overflowing barrel, uh, end up with more water around the foundation of your house than you would like. So the capacity consideration is really important. I apologize for all the background noise. I was not anticipating quite this much action this morning, um, but please bear with me, I appreciate it. Okay, so we're thinking about a thousand square foot footprint of a house generating 623 gallons. Well, that's too much. I don't wanna, I don't wanna capture that much. That's all right, we've got lots of options um, and we can, we can implement some different strategies to help curtail the possibility of an overflowing rain barrel creating a huge mess. Um, the first thing to do is be strategic about which downspouts you're using. Uh, maybe you've got different downspouts for different sides of your house. You've got a downspout that only captures a certain amount of water from perhaps one roof surface that would be much more reasonable. Um, you can also increase the capacity of your rain barrels as well. 
So having that having that reference as to how much one inch of water is going to generate over the course or over the course of a rain event is, is really important. I think in Kansas City area on average we get I think somewhere between 45 and 52 inches of rain. Um, and and I, I didn't include that in there and that's not a number that I I'm 100% confident in, but I know it's a fair amount of rain. Um, so there's the frequency of rain events that are going to impact this as well. Sometimes we have much bigger than one inch rain events. Uh, I recently learned this week, I thought it was very interesting. The actual world record for the highest amount of rainfall in an hour, world record is in Holt, Missouri. And this happened, I believe in the 1940s. Um, but that is the current world record for amount of rainfall in one hour. It was 12 inches in Holt, Missouri. And that was just very, very interesting to me. Um, so it, overflow is a big consideration. Capacity is a big consideration. So what are some solutions to that? Obviously we can do multiple barrels, right? If we have seven 55 gallon barrels, we have 350 gallons worth of storage. Uh, which is, did I do that math up, right? Yes, I believe so. Um, so you can daisy chain barrels together, uh, which is a really good option. And we'll show you a little bit about daisy chaining when we're doing the installation. Uh, but this definitely increases the capacity. It increases the cost of the installation a little bit. Um, but as Mark comes on and talks to you about what options you have through bridging the gap to purchase rain barrels, it, it, uh, it can be do, done relatively cheaply. The biggest thing you're thinking about when you're doing multiple barrels is you want them to fill up all at the same time or do you want them to fill up one at a time and that'll really affect how you uh, install that project but it is a good option another really important option and a really important consideration is having adequate overflow um, so we can't predict the weather we don't know what the biggest rain event's gonna be over any given season. So we need to protect ourselves against it. And we need to protect our homes against it too. Generally our downspouts are right next to our homes. That means we're gonna install our rain barrels right next to our homes. That means if we have an overflow event, we need to move that water somewhere away from our home. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I see with rain barrels is people not planning where that overflow is going to end up. Um, so you can see here this a uh, homeowner has a modest installation of two barrels. They can capture about 110 gallons of water. After that, they've got a, a relatively large size diameter pipe and they actually have two overflows on that second barrel um, buried to send the overflow into the rock garden, the rock bed, um, which, is, which is really important. They're moving that water away from their house. That water is gonna flow away from the house um, so you don't, you want to make sure it's not flowing back towards your house, get it sloped downhill somewhere uh, and find a different utilization for it rather than just overflowing right next to your house. Another really great option is to have your rain barrel overflow into a rain garden. Rain gardens are specifically designed to hold a lot of rain. So where you have a rain barrel captures 55 gallons of water. Um, you could put in a, I believe 80 square foot rain garden. And if you depress it six inches, you have the capacity to store all the rainwater you need from a one inch rain event on a 1000 square foot footprint. Um, so the capacity of a rain garden is much, much greater uh, per square footage than a, a rain barrel might be. So being able to utilize that rainwater, uh, prevent it from combining the rest of the stormwater runoff from impervious surfaces, capturing what you need for usage at a later time, and then diverting the overflow into a rain garden, I think is a really smart option. You're kind of getting the best of all worlds in this capacity. You can see this one's great. It has a dry creek bed. I recommend these dry creek beds and installation of rocks um, in these rain gardens because it really helps prevent erosion. Um, because that water can flow so quickly. And you really wanna prevent erosion. Erosion is just gonna to lead to increased sediment in our stormwater systems, which is something that we're really trying to avoid. So I think getting a rain barrel that overflows into a rain garden is an excellent option for homeowners. A 
natural pairing. Okay, something else that you're going to perhaps consider is an upstream diverter. So you're gonna have an overflow potentially um, on your rain ba barrel. You also have the opportunity to divert water upstream, right? So there's all sorts of downspout diverters. And essentially, once that rain barrel fills up, there's gonna be a valve, some sort of mechanism that activates so that it diverts the rainwater outside of the rain barrel. So you don't have to worry about it overflowing. Um, it's gonna seal itself off. All that other water is just gonna go to the overflow pipe elsewhere. Um, so you do have options. You can, you can overflow from your barrel. You can overflow from your downspout diverter. There's a lot of different um, parts that you can get to, to create a downspout diverter, uh, but they're not very expensive and it is a good option. Another important consideration that you need is what are your water needs, right? So great, we're diverting, we're diverting stormwater runoff. But what about using that water as a resource? How much water am I gonna need? So it's important to use the water out of your rain barrel frequently, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, but a fine application of rain barrels is just filling up a water can to water your container plants, to water your house plants, to water um, ornamentals around your landscape. Some people, however, like to use it to irrigate their vegetable gardens, which is a really great way to utilize your rain barrels. Um, some important considerations here. Vegetable gardens need about one inch of water per week. Um, so if you think about that, if you have a thousand square foot garden, it's gonna be the same amount of water that your thousand foot, your 1000 square foot house can produce, um, which is convenient. So basically the size of your house if, or your, the impervious surface that you're collecting rainwater from, um, that will translate to the capacity to the amount, the amount of water coming off of that can essentially translate square foot to square foot to gardening needs, um, which is convenient. So again, thousand square foot garden needs about 623 gallons of water a week. That's a lot of water. Um, most people probably don't have thousand square foot gardens, but if you have something like a raised bed, a four by eight, that's uh, 32 square foot, you'll need about 20 gallons of water a week, which is much more reasonable. You're much more likely to capture that water and be able to uh, ration it out as needed throughout the summer. So you can see here, um, this gardener has rain barrels positioned in a convenient location right near their uh, raised beds. And it's gonna be an adequate amount of water for that space. So this is a really well-designed system. It's simple, uh, the water is where they need it, and it's gonna have the capacity to, to do what it needs. Some other options for rain barrels, uh, things you can use. I've seen rain barrels used for bird baths, um, insect watering, spaces uh some people wash you know people can you can wash your cars that's more of a just a utilization of water not having to pay for it because that water is going to end up in that storm water system again um, but again it's it's essentially free water so there's a million different ways you can use it all right another really important consideration is gravity do you need water pressure for your rain barrel application? Um, the answer is yes. You do need to get your rain barrel up off the ground to a certain capacity. Um, it's gonna make the water flow a lot easier. Um, and if you elevate it high enough, you can actually get a little bit of water pressure, perhaps enough water pressure to install a drip irrigation system, which requires a, lo a low level pressure. Um, the higher you can get your rain barrels up, generally, the more water pressure you get, which makes the applications greater for your rain barrel. So I always recommend elevating them as high as you can. Obviously that's not an option everywhere. Um, so we recommend just a couple of cinder blocks. That way you have access to the spigot. Uh, you're not fighting trying to get some sort of weird catchment container underneath your rain barrel to get that water out. Um, so try to elevate those rain barrels as much as you can. Uphill considerations of rain barrels, sources of debris. 
So number one maintenance issue for rain barrels, and I, I'm not gonna call it an issue, I'm gonna call it a just a routine maintenance activity is going to be removing debris from the upstream sources of your rain barrel. So if you've got a lot of trees overhead, over your roof, that's great, that's fantastic. Um, but you're probably gonna end up with a lot of leaves and other plant material in your gutters. And that's gonna affect the performance of your rain barrel. Um, they do tend to get clogged if these things aren't dealt with, especially by leaves. They're notoriously good at clogging up screens and filters. Um, so trying to avoid leaves in the gutter is gonna be important. You'll definitely wanna clean them out before you install your rain barrel. There are some things you can do though, because you're never gonna be able to control all the sediment and um, leaves upstream of your rain barrel. You can do a couple of different things. Um, so every rain barrel is going to have some sort of screen at the inlet, whether it's over the entirety of the rain barrel, whether it's just at, um, at a select hole, we'll show you what we do here at Bridging the Gap with our rain barrel inlet filters. Um, but you wanna filter right there because that's gonna be your last resort to catch that um, debris. Gutter guards are also an excellent, excellent choice. Um, if you have gutter gar guards, your house is well set up to install rain barrels. Um, so that's an option for you as well. Install those gutter guards. There's also what's called a first flush diverter. And these are good for a couple of different reasons. So these are going to be upstream from your rain barrel. And essentially what they do is they provide a reservoir for that first bit of water to come down your downspout and get captured, um, which which is the water that's going to have all that sediment and debris in it. So that sediment and debris is going to be that first flush water from a rainstorm. Um, from what I understand, the first tenth of an inch of rain is going to capture basically all of the sediment that is on an impervious surface. So you don't need a one inch rain event to, um, to move all that sediment. All you need is a tenth of an inch. So it's important to get that first flush of water. Uh, it's gonna pull out any contaminants, any debris, First flush diverters do a good job doing that. So as that reservoir fills up, um, that ball is going to move to the top. And then once that reservoir is full of that first flush of water, you're gonna get um, the, you know, theoretically less sediment filled water to go into your rain barrel, um, which makes for healthier water. And if you're using it for your garden, that's great. Plants tend to do better with rain water than um, than tap water. That's another advantage of rain barrels. I can say that from experience as I um, have a small farm and you can tell the difference when you're starting seedlings. Certainly uh, the difference between using rain water and using tap water. So it's good to remove that contamination. All right, and we'll move on to maintenance. So we're looking at maintenance of our rain barrels. We've thought about our different considerations. We have our capacity. Um, we're gonna learn how to build one. You guys will build it, put it in. How do I take care of it now? Um, so we get a lot of questions every year about, oh, I'm having, you know, I've seen this in my rain barrel. What are my options? Um, and the maintenance tasks are generally pretty much the same for everybody. And we same, see the same issues for everybody. So the number one thing you can do to maintain your rain barrel is to use your water. This is what we we will on occasion see people install rain barrels and then not use the water and then you know issues will develop so a lot of different issues can develop with stagnant water one of the big ones is algae if you have exposure to sunlight and you're not frequently using your water you're going to end up with algae in your tank it's going to clog all your valves it might clog your overflow um, you may end up with a bigger mess on your hand if you get an algae problem. So you want to avoid putting, or you want to avoid not using your water. Um, it's also good to keep sunlight off of, off of your rain barrel. So we recommend blue, darker colored rain barrels, gray. The white ones tend to let in a lot of sunlight and, and we tend to see more algae growth in those. So if you do have access to a white rain barrel, I would recommend maybe painting it or putting some sort of cover around it keep that sunlight from getting in there. The other big problem with stagnant water, which we're all very familiar with, is mosquito larva. 
Um, so we really want to prevent that. Again, we can prevent that by utilizing our water. Uh, other contaminants can grow in water. You can make your rain barrel clean, uh, dirty and unsightly. It can make it smell bad, which is, is really unfortunate. Um, so using your water is your best maintenance plan. Another important thing you're gonna to wanna to do every year is winterize your rain barrel. Um, so we don't really wanna capture rainwater in the winter for a lot of reasons. So if we have a full rain barrel, it's not a super durable plastic, it's gonna freeze and it's gonna crack the entirety of your container. So you don't wanna do that. Even if you don't have it completely full, if you're not winterizing your valves, you can break your valves and require maintenance and have a dysfunctional rain barrel come spring. Um, so step one is to fully empty your rain barrel, empty those valves out, make sure all your hoses are disconnected. You really don't wanna let anything freeze. Um, step two, clean. Make sure all that sediment's off of there. Maybe give it an extra deep clean. Um, you know, just use a little Dawn soap with uh to clean out the interior you can get rid of any you know microorganisms that may have taken up shop there over the course of the summer um, knock those guys out make sure there's no sediment resting in the bottom of your rain barrel there's always that little bottom inch that doesn't really get drained out very often um, so it's important to get that out clean it make sure it's in good shape for next year uh, step three, you're definitely going to want to make sure that you reroute that water. So uh, you had your rain barrel installed at a downspout. You're going to want to put something in place to keep that water away from your house so that you're not just um, letting all the snow melt, letting any winter storm water pre precipitation accumulate there at the base of, at the base of um, your house or foundation. So make sure to reroute that water. Step four, flip it upside down and, and Keep it in a safe space until spring when you can start collecting water again. Okay, mosquitoes. Say you've got a rain barrel, you can, you're using it frequently enough, but we know the life cycle of mosquitoes is so quick. You can have standing water for 24, 48 hours and you're going to get mosquitoes. So what I recommend doing is making sure that you've got a relatively mosquito proof tank so that they cannot access the water in the first place, right? Making sure your screens are in good conditions. You don't have any open holes. Your overflow valve isn't an easy access port for mosquitoes to get in. Um, those are all good controls to keep mosquitoes out of that space. But if you can't avoid it, what I recommend using are mosquito dunks. So these are a really low cost option. It is a biological control. Um, you can use it in organic vegetable production. It's very closely related to uh, Bt, if it isn't actually a type of Bt, but it's basically a, a bacteria that will infect the mosquito larva and kill them. So it doesn't do any damage to any other insect species and they're really quite effective. It won't kill adult mosquitoes, but it does kill the larva and they're, and they're very low cost. So it's a good option. Okay, so those are the major maintenance considerations. Um, I do, I'm gonna leave some space here for questions before we get started with the installation process. I may have to track down Mark here in a second, but I just want to uh, remind you all of or inform you of the Johnson County, Kansas reimbursement program. Um, so if you live in one of the cities listed here on the right, your city has a reimbursement program for stormwater management projects um, that you would install at your house. Specific rain barrels are certainly included. Um, there's a couple of considerations you can be reimbursed up to 50%. A lot of times there's a cap of $75 per rain barrel for up to two rain barrels. Um, so you'll get 50% reimbursement uh, up to $75. There's a lot of different options for buying rain barrels out there. You can get them at most hardware stores. Uh, that's, that's I recommend getting a recycled product if you're, if you're able to. The, um, the energy intensity or the amount of energy it takes to, to manufacture a new plastic rain barrel is, is pretty large. So if you can find a recycled source, that's what I recommend doing. Um, a lot of times they're a lot more affordable. Bridging the gap 
we sell rain barrels and a lot of you guys did purchase rain barrels um, and we're excited to get you guys set up to get those installed. We get all of our barrels from um, a local manufacturer, they're food grade, and we sell them for much, much more afford, uh, much more affordable price than what you would find at like Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, so we sell the the completely assembled rain barrels for sixty-five dollars, and then you can separately just buy rain barrels if you perhaps want to daisy chain them together, create a bigger system uh, for fifteen dollars, and then kits for twenty dollars. So you can kind of craft the system that you want through uh, just getting barrels or kits. Um, so if you guys are interested in the Johnson County, Kansas reimbursement program, you can go to containtherainjoco.com. There's an application process there for residents of certain cities, just uh, Westwood, Westwood Hills, Roland Park, and um, Fairway. If you live in any other city, you're gonna wanna go ahead and click on the link to that city that's on the webpage and they'll put you in, in contact with the, um, the individual that's running that program and, and see what the considerations for applications are there. Generally, they're gonna want before and after pictures. They're going to want itemized receipts that are very clear. Um, and they're gonna wanna know that it's properly installed and set up to capture storm water since that's the function of this program is to get you guys containing as much rainwater as you can. Um, so we're all doing our part to, to help our, our local watershed. Um, there are, there's reimbursement for also native trees, rain gardens, um, installing native plants if you're interested, if those native plants are capturing rainwater in some capacity. Uh, so do check out the entirety of the website for contain the rain. Um, there is a deadline for this program and it is first come first serve. So if you are wanting to, if you're wanting to uh, get reimbursed for a rain barrel, I suggest getting your application in sooner rather than later. So I am going to open this up to questions. I think that, you know, if you guys have questions, go ahead and speak up. We don't have a, a huge crowd, so I don't think we'll be talking over each other too much. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and open it up to questions. I have a question. Yeah. What kind of materials are in the kits you said? Like, just, um, I was kind of confused. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. So, uh, Mark is going to be actually walking us through a full kit here in a second. Um, we've got our rain barrel stuff set up, but I'll show you real quick. Here's the kit. It's pretty simple, pretty simple, straightforward. It's a lot of recycled parts that we use ourselves, um, but we've got hoses, spigots, screens, all the parts that you would need to make a rain barrel um, out of just a 55 gallon drum, which as you can see as well, we have a ton of here at Bridging the Gap. Uh, the recycling center up here. We also have them down at our Red Bridge location. Um, so there's a lot of different, there's, yeah, it's a pretty straightforward little kit. And we'll walk through all these parts with you guys here in a second, if that helps. All right, Mark, thank you. Got a, yep. Got a question for you. Uh-huh. Yeah, they, I saw the, uh, we're interested, we're gonna be interested in the, uh, raised gardens, uh, capturing water for raised gardens out there. And I noticed that they were, looked like a couple of them were next to a building, but I didn't see how it was being captured off the building. Where does that water in those rain barrels come from? Is it just natural capture that falls into it or where? So there's a there's interesting things you can do. Uh, there's something called a rain chain. And I've seen people actually install rain chains out of the canopy of their trees to help capture rainwater, which I think is a really, really interesting application. Um, but they'll help aggregate water and uh, flow it down a system. So you can also use rain chains to kind of branch it out a little ways, as long as you've got the right slope that you're, that you're using that chain. But a lot of times people will just get really creative with their downspouts. And as long as you've got a quarter inch drop every foot, you can move water where you want it. So if you're starting with a 10 foot house, you know, you can move water pretty far away if you're willing to to put a downspout, you know, kind of arching through your yard. So, yeah, no, and, and I understand that 
uh, how gravity is going to work for you. I just didn't see any spouts going to these barrels that you had in your display. Yeah, that's why I was wondering where it was coming from. So there are I've also seen some people uh, if they have like a a really tall rain barrel somewhere, you can attach a hose to the bottom of it um, and use that hose to move water. Maybe you have a buried hose that goes into your rain barrel to transport water that way if you can get enough. Um, if you okay. can up that rain barrel and essentially use that pressure to move water through that hose and fill a rain barrel that, you know, it's definitely not as tall as the original big catchment system, um, but can move water that way too. Thank you. So, uh-huh. Do I have any other questions from you guys? Cool. Well, I'm going to let Mark get started here with installation or the, the building of a rain barrel. Um, and he'll take it from here. So if you guys have trouble hearing, go ahead and speak up. If you've got questions, I would also say go ahead and speak up. Uh, can everybody see the, lo the work location all right? Looks good. It looks centered. Cool. We're going to move the table forward just a little bit so we get closer. Thank you, thank you. Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Doremus Recycle Center here at Bridging the Gap. We're on the environmental campus in the Northeast Industrial Area. And as Claire was saying, this is where we store all of our barrels here, all of our rain barrels, the ones that are unmodified, the ones that need to be prepped and cut and ready to go. But uh, we used to be at the Metro North, and that's where we stored all of our barrels. Now we're storing them down here. We moved our recycle center from the Metro North. We're in Pleasant Valley Park, but this is where we store all of our barrels down here. As you can see, most of our barrels are blue, and I'll pull one of the blue ones out here in a little bit, but as Claire was saying, they're all food grade barrels, and these are the ones that you want. The company, they called us, well, I kind of back up. We were going all the way to Gardner, Kansas, to Olathe, Kansas, to buy the barrels. They were all food grade from businesses. And our carbon footprint was just terrible. We were going back and forth. We'd pick them up out south, bring them up north, clean them, prep them, cut them. And then we had big sales every year to Olathe North School District. And um, since the pandemic, we haven't been selling that many to them. But uh, carbon footprint was terrible and then we got a call from a business up in Northland hey well you've got barrels for food grade so sometimes it was worth the wait but we finally got these barrels twice as cheap but uh they're pretty cool and I'll show you one right here like I said it is a food grade and you've got two different types of barrels this one here is considered a close top one and the way the water gets inside it, we'll cut a hole on top of it to get the water in it. We'll go over that process a little bit. And then these are the ones we got. These are considered an open top. As Claire was saying, these are very functional, just like a big pill bottle or something. But you have access in there and you can clean it out all the time. She was saying you're going to get a lot of silt and sediment. You'll get buildup in there. And uh, your bib, your host bib, it's going to get filled up with uh, sediments. We want you to always use the water. She said, use that water, even if you're just watering the foundation plants around your house, you know, just keep that water flowing, keep it going all the time. And here's one of the uh, bibs, the hose bib we use. It's just the plastic one. It's not the brass, it's not metal. You don't need all the hardware. You don't need to screw it in there and put it on the hardware. We just use these and these work real well. And we'll go back to this in a second when I drill these, you'll see how easily they go in. But yeah, back to the barrels, the rain barrels, we've been doing this for a long time. A uh, previous uh, manager, she had the program going and then we kind of took it up to the next notch, notch and we've been selling a lot, but we do have a lot. And Claire, I just want to share with you as of now, we have some rain barrels back there. They're, they're scarred and marred a little bit. We're gonna let a fully assembled rain barrel go for $45. Woo! Yeah. Nice. So $45 down to 45 from 65. 
And if aesthetics is not the concern, some are just scratched up like that. It's not bad, but they're still functional. There's nothing wrong with the barrel. We decided we're gonna let some go for 45. But if it's a newer barrel that's not scratched or anything, they'll go for 65. But um, we, um, we've been getting these barrels for a long time, and now that we're getting them up at the food grade place, we're really, we're really excited to get these. We're gonna continue making them. We'll have them all throughout the year too. And then if you even buy a second one, there's a good chance we might even make some discounts too. But Claire shared with you how to get the barrels. You just go on our website, you can order them online. You'll pick them up either down here on Doramus or out at Redbridge. We get them shipped out south, out to Redbridge out there to pick up. But I kind of want to mention about the workshops. We've been doing this six, seven years. We've been in Johnson County numerous times. We've been at parks. We did, we've been with different municipalities, Lenexa, Overland Park, Shawnee. We've been in numerous places in Kansas conducting rain barrel workshops the last four or five years. Here in Kansas City too, we've been to, uh, we've been to community centers, we've been to uh, churches, and we're always open to having a mobile rain barrel workshop somewhere. If you guys are interested, if you know a church or someone wants one, just let us know. We'll be mobile. We'll come to you. We'll bring all the parts. We'll bring everything. But uh, we've been doing this for a lot of years. We're excited. We want to continue doing it. But um, I'll get into the um, to the construction of it here and again. But uh, let's see what we got. Where should I start? This is the fun part. This is the fun part, I agree. <laughs> you know, I think I'll go through all the parts. As someone was asking earlier, all the rain barrels are repurposed. Again, this business was just going to grind them up, chip them, and put them in the landfill. They wanted to, know, wanted to know if we could repurpose them, and we absolutely jumped right on it. But we used to get our barrels from Coca-Cola, from other businesses, they had their products coming in, and they just chip them, grind them, shred them. So we decided to repurpose them. But um, again, we're keeping this out of the landfill, we're repurposing it, and these are durable. These are really thick plastic. It's not like the, pre, the manufacturing ones you see at the hardware stores. They're so thin. And as Claire was saying, a lot of people keep water in them. They don't use it. They keep it all throughout the winter and it cracks at the seams on them. And then they'll bring it to us to recycle that durable plastic, which we can't do. And I think I mentioned, I'm at, we're at a recycle center now. We recycle all the materials they take at curbside. But they would bring it to us. There was nothing we could do with it. But we have never had one of our barrels crack at the seam. We never had any problem with it. So these are durable. These are great barrels to have. You're going to love them. But again, these are all repurposed. We just want to reuse them. These flower pots are from Trader Joe's. And um, they're, there's no herbicide. There's no pesticides. They're good to use. And all we did was um, drilled holes on the bottom. And these will go right on top of the barrel so the water can come down in there. Then I'll show you in a little bit how we make it. But these, uh, this plastic here, these flower pots, they're not as durable as the barrels. So we ask you to take this in every winter, if you would. Just take it indoors because we don't want it. It may crack on you. We've heard some people saying it cracks on it. But we just want you to take that inside your home and keep it from a cracking. The only thing we buy at the hardware stores is a sump pump hose. We purchase it in a kit, and inside a kit, there's a bag, it's 24 feet long. So what we do is cut it into four pieces. So we have four of these out of one kit. So this is what we purchase that's not recycled. As I showed you earlier, the hose bib, plastic, it works perfect for us. We never had any problem with anybody. The only time we've had problem with it leaking at the bottom is when it's in the barrel. People use it as a handle when they're cleaning, they're moving it. We don't want you to use it as a handle. So even when you're transporting the barrel from the pickup to your home, put this hose bib in at the last minute. It's a good tight fit, but we just don't want you to, we don't want it to be compromised. It may roll around in your vehicle, in your back seat or whatever, but we've had no problem with these plastic hose bibs. Then we have a plastic hose barb, it works well. 
and the barb goes on top of the barrel. We'll go into the construction of that in a little bit. It goes on to the top. And of course, once it goes on to the top, we'll hook up the um, sump pump hose. We work with an inch and a quarter. If you buy a sump pump kit, it'll be a whole bag, 24 foot long. You're going to get two size barbs. You'll get an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half. We just stay with the inch and a quarter. We do have hole saws to drill an inch and a half. We want to keep it consistent. We want to keep it consistent. So we just work with the inch and a quarter ones. But here's one here. The um, the faucet, the hose bib. I think everybody's probably wondering, I wonder if I could put my hose on it. You can put your hose on it. It'll fit right on there. It's a universal size. It slipped my mind what size that is. Three quarters. Three quarters, I believe. Hose, right. some special fitting type. Yep. Yeah, but a regular hose would just fit on there. And Claire covered a lot through this workshop. I'm just going to really work on the construction about having your barrel elevated so you can create a little water pressure. She covered a lot of that. But um, I want to share one other thing to you. In our neighborhood here in the urban core Northeast, we have a couple orchards in. And there's other neighborhoods that have orchards. And one group did not have a rain barrel. So they just wanted rainwater. They had truck, they had the energy. They were transporting when the apple trees and pear trees were planted. And I'll give a plug to Giving Grove. Giving Grove is under the umbrella of Kansas City Community Gardens. We work with them and they're kind of our direction. They let us know what good apple trees are good and what pear trees. But we would take a lot of our rainwater to our orchard here in the Sheffield neighborhood. So we collected it in our 55 gallon barrels. And then as Claire was saying, you've got so much water, you want to use it. So what we were doing, we were transfer, transporting, transferring the water from the 55 gallons as they were full to the back of the property and three or 275 gallon plastic totes. I wanted one of those down here to show you, but everybody has seen them in the back of trucks. They just got the metal cage on them. They're plastic. They got a hole on top, a bung cap. You just screw the cap off. But we would uh, store a couple of 300 gallon totes because we knew we were going to be using that water the first two years when these apple trees were being planted. And then also under Bridging the Gap, we have our Heartland Tree Alliance, one of our other programs. We had 20 trees planted in our neighborhood, so we needed water there. And some people didn't want to incorporate a rain barrel because they were new to it, but they were willing to learn about the, the benefits of rainwater. So we had one homeowner jump up, decided he wanted the barrels, and he put a toe in his yard. We collected the water. And we engaged, we educated the uh, residents, and next thing you know, all the other residents wanted a rain barrel. They took it one step at a time. But uh, we would transfer the water from the barrels to the tote 100, 200 feet away with this utility sump pump. These work really well. When it comes to water pressure, these work really well. It's funny, when uh, I put barrels up at my mom and dad's house, dad thought it was going to be turn on the hose, it was going to be like a hose the faucet is house, you're going to get that much pressure. It wasn't. But then until I incorporated this, then he was happy. <laughs> but we used the water because he was always in a hurry, whatever. But this utility sump pump home will work. A pond pump will work too. It'll take the water from your barrels to the hose to wherever you need it to go. So as Claire said, if you have your barrel elevated, if you put it on four cinder blocks, you're going to get some good water pressure. If you're in a hurry, if you need to move that water a little quicker, these utility sump pump hose work really well. And if you can envision the uh, totes, 275 gallon totes, they've got that bunk cap on top where you screw in. You got to make sure this utility pump fits in there, that this is a smaller diameter than that. I've had some troubles with some. This one here is not really circular but it's a little kind of elongated shape and i had a hard time getting it in so i just shopped around i found this one which is round smaller in diameter and um it fit right into that the the tote the 275 gallon tote but i want to share these are good investments if you need a lot of water 
you decide to incorporate a 275 gallon tow in the back of your yard, at your orchard, your garden, this is always good to move them around. And I brought up the 275 gallon tow. We really don't have any, but there are some out there. You could go online, people are selling them. You might even call Bridge in the Gap once in a while. Sometimes we may run across some. We just don't really want to store them down there. We want to make sure we got a good turnover. They sell quick. But that was a benefit for our community, incorporating a tote and moving the water, using it for our trees, as well as using it for our uh, urban orchards. So that was a win-win. All right, let's move on here. I've covered everything with supplies. Again, these flower pots, we got these from Trader Joe's. It's a little thinner plastic. I want to repeat, they're not as durable, but put those inside. And since I'm on these now, we did not buy the fiberglass screen. We have a fiberglass screen that goes over the top of the barrel or the uh, flower pot. That's what keeps the big leaves out, the big organic material. However, you're going to get some sediment. You're going to get some silt in there. You'll even get some, some of the uh, particles from your roof coming down in there. That's why we want you to clean it out every year. You can every year. And then if you have the open top one, it's going to be really easy. because You can just reach your hand down there. You can get a mop, take it to the car wash, but keep it clean. You'll be surprised how much you get out of there. And then if you tie it into a second barrel, which we'll go into a little bit, you'll capture all that silt sediment in the first one. So just make sure you always keep that clean all the time. And here's what we do. Again, this is not a recycled material. We just buy regular fiberglass screen at the hardware store. We were, when the brain barrel first started, we were using the bicycle tube tires to tie around here. And everybody knows they're not as durable. They fray, and they tear on us. So we replaced them. People were calling us to replace them. And we were just cracking the just trying to decide what can we use can we use a big rubber band what can we use to go around here and one of my volunteers from high school says, mark you're real satisfied with this durable fiberglass screen right he says well let's see if we could use it and it worked out well i had a youngster from high school teach me that this is the best thing but we purchase our screens um i put it over there i've been cutting some over there but we purchased it at the hardware store too and what I'll do is just get this fiberglass screen. Some of you probably got your kits already and some haven't, but I'll just kind of fold up the, uh, the strap of the fiberglass screen to make it a long piece here. This is kind of a challenging part here. Bear with me. Yeah, if you kind of keep the flat screen there, but as I was saying, you just kind of double it up here I'm gonna reach over here, hopefully you don't grab player's wrist. And But you could get a good tight fit right here. You could get a good tight fit. And then I think I've got it right here. Yep. Thank you, thank you. And we'll just get the screen, we'll pull down the excess. We'll just use the strap as a tie down. We'll get a really tight knot on there. I pretty tight on there and then we're good and everybody sees all the excess well that's not aesthetically pleasing that just kind of don't cut it off just leave it on there because I'll show you what we're gonna do with it but well I'm just pulling this really tight pulling down the excess fiberglass screen here we'll just pull it down And you can see it looks good on top. It's really tight. It's really flat. And then it'll go right into the. Now that one's not cut. It'll, once we cut the hole, it'll go right inside the barrel. And I'll show you how do we cut this to make sure that it doesn't fall into the barrel. But um, I think we'll go right into that. But this is the kit of what we use. And again, I'm going to stress it again this plastic's not as durable. So we'll be extra cautious with it, take it in indoors. And again, the only parts we buy at the hardware store is the hose bib. We don't use the metal one. The plastic is good. Some people probably see the tape that we have on there. Just to help it out, a little better fit, we do that. 
And it could be a challenge if it did leak on the bottom once you put the hose bib in there, because you don't want that water running out. Sometimes we're busy, hurry, you just may put a bucket underneath there, five gallon bucket, collect it until you have time to take it out, empty the barrel, take it out, and put more tape on there. But we never really had any problems with anything leaking. Then we put a piece of tape on the the uh, barb, which goes on top. I think we'll go right into that, showing you how we cut it, how we make it. Everybody's wondering, how does that work? So I got a marker here. I believe. Oh, can you get that marker out of the bag down there? Yeah. And then I'll show them here. for that. I'll show you one here, one of our open top barrels that's already been cut. It's already been cut. It's prepped. It's ready to go. And then we just drop the uh, flower pot right in there. It's a good tight fit. Good tight fit. And then what we do is we get the uh, We'll get the flower pot, we'll put it right on top of the lid. And a lot of times we center it, we'll center it right in the middle because your downspout, here's a little uh, visual, your downspout will uh, just kind of hover the elbow will kind of hover right above the hole of your barrel and it'll just fall right in there. It'll just fall right in there. So you could put it right in the middle. And this one here, this one here is the glow stop. And we bought, we got a bunch of barrels and we didn't have that many of the bunk caps. We didn't have that many bunk caps, so I just have one. We have two different types. We have one with the fine thread, which is on that side, and we have one over here, which is on the coarse side. But I've only got one here, so this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the hole here, and I'll do that here. I'll make the circle, and I'm gonna cut it right here. Then I'll go into what tools we use, why it's gotta be a certain way. Let me get this out of the way, get some prepping going. Looks like Claire Samey, she's got a marker. Very good. And again, we got that flower pot. We're going to put it right in the middle. I've got another one, it's probably about the same. <laughs> See if this one works a little better. If not, I know I got a backup in the truck. But we'll put our circle on the lid on this open top barrel. And you've noticed I've got the flower pot turned upside down. This is the bigger diameter on the bottom. We want the bigger diameter on the bottom. And then when we cut, we're going to cut right inside. right inside the hole. So once it falls in there, it rests right here on the lip on the flower pot. So before we cut it, I'm gonna get my hole saw and my drill together. Battery operated drill. These have really worked out for us really good. <clears throat> I'm gonna kind of 
jump back and forth here. This is a hole saw we use to cut into it. Everybody's got hole saws at home, but you probably don't have the size that it's needed. This is important. That's why we kind of recommend you just getting a fully assembled barrel. You know, we want to generate some sales, but we've had people struggle using their own hose saw. They couldn't find the hose bib or the hose bar wouldn't fit. They couldn't find the uh, hose bib. They couldn't find them on the shelves. A lot of times you can't find these on the shelves at hardware stores. Then sometimes you have to make a special order. And we buy them in quantity from a True Value Hardware out in Grandview. We got a good working relationship with them. The more we buy, the better discount we got. So you can kind of get a little visual here. This size here of my whole saw is a 25 millimeter. It was all white. It's a Lennox brand name, 25 millimeter. You can kind of see how the diameters match up, how it's good. But it's very important you have the right whole saw. And again, this one here, it's a 25 millimeter. We're very happy with it. We never had any problem with it. right here <laughs> and then here's the other hole saw that we use for <clears throat> for the hose bar you can see you get a visual it's a good fit guys it's very important you have the right hole saw to fit and again we'll have them all made like i said we'll have some are just scratched up some of the rain barrels 45 dollars We'll have those. And it's very important if you make your own, you got to get the right size. What Old size source. was that one, Mark? Oh, uh, very good. This one I should know. This is a Lennox brand name. We've used it so many times. I just barely see it in my eyesight. But this is a 41 millimeter. 41 millimeter. Where the smaller one was a 25 millimeter. And here on this one, on the bigger hole saw, it says inch and five eighths too, or 41 millimeter. So I guess they are uh, pretty close, but uh, it's a Lennox bimetal, it's the same brand name. We got those out at Lowe's. But back to the drill, we've got to put a little starter hole in this lid so we can cut into it. So I'll get a good tight fit there. I'll get the lid over here. And as I mentioned, we're going to cut right inside. I don't want to cut it right on the line, drill right on the line. I'm going to go right inside so that flower pot can rest, the lift can rest right on there. And so where can you get the uh, stuff? Yep. It should be everything. I'll put the blade on it. And then the drill, like I said, we're just going to put it right on that line. Make sure my drill's going clockwise. And when you do drill, just don't wobble back and forth. It's very important when you drill into your barrel. You don't want your holes compromised for your bib or bar. Here on top, it's not as bad, but we need a little starter hose so we get our saw in there. When you do drill, let the hose saw do the work. Don't push down really hard. Just let it do its work. If it stops, if it clogs up a little bit, just tap it. Let the machine, let the hose saw do the work. You can see right here, I drilled it right here. Now I'm going to get my saw and I'm going to cut right inside the whole diameter. So we'll get this out of the way. Claire's getting me set up there. You got it right in. I always struggle. <laughs> got it? Yep. Yeah, I always take my blade out 
And uh, she plugged it out. She's plugging back up, so we're ready. We'll make sure we've got some juice going here. We are ready to go. We always want to practice safety. We'll put our uh, safety glasses on, but I don't know if these are going to fit over mine. So we'll stress safety, but I'm not going to wear them. All right, so we've got that. Get the grill over here. And this is very important too, just like drilling a hole, you want to make sure you don't move your drill around. When you cut, you want to stay right inside. You don't want to go on the existing line. But I'll show you once I make the cut here, why it's important. Yeah, as long as it doesn't move. see the hole that I've cut I've stayed within the black line and again this is very important and then we'll just drop the flower pot in there the flower pot will go right in there it's snug it doesn't it doesn't shake around now everybody's looking what about all that excess green again we're just gonna tuck it right down inside the hole we'll just pick up the flower pot the excess fiber screen, our glass screen, we'll just tuck it in there. And again, I pulled it real tight so it uh, looks good. And you can see one that's very tight. It's just in there, all the excess is in there. That's a good fit. It doesn't move around. Claire was talking about the algae buildup. You want to use this water. Like we, I'm gonna stress again, you always want to use the water. People worry about the mosquitoes. If you're using the water, you're going to be good. Even at the hardware store, they have some of the mosquito gunk, a little granular stuff. I've heard some mostly good things about it, but you, it doesn't harm your plants, your garden or anything. But if you worry about mosquitoes, just use that water all the time. Even if you're just getting rid of it so you can clean it, if you got a little bit, just uh, use it all the time. But again, you can see it's a good fit. This is the open top barrel. Now we're gonna do the same for the closed top. And I've got a closed top right here. And as I mentioned, we have two different bunk caps. This one, we only have one. This is a fine one. So we'll match up with that. Now, the open top, we put it right in the middle. But this one's just gonna jump over a little bit. So we'll go right over here. Plus I need one of these for sale. <laughs> we had 50 of these barrels and they only had one cap because when the company uses it, they usually take off the fine thread one. They leave the course behind. So we were going online, look at the prices, they were like $253. I said, hey, let's just move the intake hole. Let's just change it. Everybody agreed and worked out well. So this one, you can see we've got the hole here. I'll go ahead and put a starter hole on here. And I'm gonna use the bigger hole saw. Again, I'm just letting the whole saw do the work. I'm not pressing down. And then you can see the uh, plastic just gets caught in there. And I'm going to see if I can pass off Miss Blair. Maybe she can put it. Yeah screwdriver in there and push that out. 
So we got our starter hole here, and I'm going to drill this. I know I just did it with the other one, but I'm going to show you uh, how we do it with this one. Thank you. And this one here, when this is formed, when this is made, this plastic is like twice as thick here. So I need a long blade that's going to go down there, and this works perfect right here. So that's why I'm showing you if anybody finds a barrel that just has one bunk cap, it is possible. on this one again I stayed within the line it's not right with the line so the barrel or the uh, flower pot would probably stick up a little more but it's still good actually it went down pretty good so you can see this flower pot doesn't shake it's good it's prep really good so it's in there good but this is important when you make this uh, when you drill a hole in here it needs to be circular because you don't want no big gap in there However, your fiberglass screen will keep any bugs from going in there, but that fiberglass screen is a big benefit, that excess. But it fits right in there, it's really tight. And I did a second one because we only had one bunk cap and we wanted to go, we wanted to be frugal and save money, so we decided to do it this way, which I will. All right, I think I've got everything covered with the kit, how to put it in on top. The next parts are really simple too now we got to drill the holes in the barrels too so this one is so special it doesn't need any so i'm gonna get this out of my way this one should be complete And I'll show you this one. Here's one of the barrels. It's kind of scratched up in transit. The warehouse, you know, aesthetics is not the big thing. We've got a bunch like this. There's nothing wrong with the barrel. They're good. They hold water. But we're going to let those uh, fully assemble ones go for $45. So now I want you to envision the rain barrel next to your house. Like Claire was saying, you want to put it in the right spot at your home. It's usually in people's backyard. That's where the garden is. The greenscape, that's where they want to collect it. Some municipalities may have some restrictions. They want it kind of, I don't know if I want to say this out of sight, out of mind, but uh, most, most of the time it's in your backyard. And uh, there's different ways. Um, when you put it in your backyard, it's going to be right by your downspout. You'll find out where your downspout is and where the right location. You know your backyard. You know where you want to put the barrel. So if you can envision it right there at that downspout in that perfect spot in your backyard, and then if you're facing the barrel, and then do you want that barrel to drain off to your right or to your left? And why that's important, sometimes it's not important because the hose, the sump up hose is six foot. You know, as Claire's saying, we want you we wanted to keep away from your foundation. We want to keep it away from our house. Once it fills up, she shared how quick these fill up. They're only 55 gallons. They fill up so quick. So you want to manage that water. So if you get a vision that barrel, you may want it to go to the right because it's in the back of the house. You have a sidewalk on the left side. And or maybe you want it on this sidewalk because it's a hardscape purpose. You can put the cinder blocks on there and you know it's solid. And those cinder blocks will elevate it. And plus the cinder blocks will they'll hold the weight of the barrel. What's the water? Eight gallons, say um, eight pounds a gallon. So I could be up to 400 gallons of weight on there so those cinder blocks will hold them so if you could again if you can envision it where it's going to be you want it to drain to your right or your left sometimes it's not that important but it is if you want to incorporate a second barrel or maybe a third barrel because you may not want it to go to your left because that's where the sidewalk is it takes you into the house 
but on the right side, you could add a second, a third barrel. You could daisy chain the barrels. You could do it that way. And we'll go into that process there, but just decide where you want it and uh, envision it. But if it's not a big thing, you've got that six foot hose. You could just run it away from your foundation. You could even get a 12 foot one, which I've got over here. Of course, it's twice as long. This is how they come from the hardware store. Again, they're 24 feet long. We just cut them in four sections. This one was not, but this one's 12 feet, and this is long enough if you're really want to keep it away from your house. This is one way you can do it. But again, they fill up so quick. And Claire was saying uh, her numbers were kind of the ones I remembered, an average size home one inch rain, you can get over 600 to 1,000 gallons of rain. That's a lot. That's where we decided it's kind of addicting collecting rainwater. You want more, you want a second barrel, a third barrel. You go inside your house, get your trash, your set go, you upset the wife. You get the five gallon containers, which I've got here. If you just get a little bit of rain, you know, you could fill up your water in containers. You can fill up these five gallons. They got handles. You could always have that stored back in the yard, but if you get a lot of rain, you got to work on another plan. There's different ways you can store contained water, but it is addicting collecting the rainwater, and that's why a lot of people incorporate that 300 gallon, the 275, 300 gallons, so they can have more water. But back to this, we cut it. Now we're going to put some um, holes in it. And then this homeowner wants it. We're going to find the most appealing, we'll just say this is the back of the house. This is you know, right up against the house, so I'm in front of the barrel. So the hole for the uh, hose bib will be on this side. So I'm going to go ahead and, and drill it. I'm going to drill it. You may not be able to see it, then I'll pick it up. I can lift it up for you if you want. But I'll take it. I think we could probably do that. I could keep it good sturdy enough. start with this one. Cool. And this one here, we're going to put it on this side and we're just going to spin this 90 degrees. So when the water gets in your barrel, you want it, you want to collect as much rainwater as you do. Everybody knows it's going to build up, it's going to go up. You don't want to put it right here in the middle because you're going to waste all that area. You want to get it up as high as you can. So this one here, the way it's manufactured, it's kind of rough right here for a workshop purposes. We're going to spin it on this side and drill smooth. It'll drill easily right here. So again, instead of putting it down here at the bottom where you're going to waste that rainwater, we're going to put it up here. And you really want to be really careful. You, Like I said, you don't want to <coughs> rock it back and forth. You don't want to compromise the whole saw, the intake saw, the hole. So I feel comfortable enough here doing this like this. Again, I'm just going to let that whole saw do the work. Once it bites up. spin it and you can see the hole up here we utilize that water it'll come all the way up on the top and um, if it did leak up here it's not I mean if it leaks you're just gonna run down you just get a little bit it's not really that bad it's down at the bottom where you put the hose bib where it's real important so when I drill that I'm gonna go ahead and put this on the ground but you can get a visual of what we just did for the overflow but I'm going to put it down on the ground horizontal and put the smaller hole in. So the overflow is going that way. So I need to go over on this side and put the hole in. Put the faucet in. And again, we'll make sure we get the right size here. We don't use the bigger one.
get a good tight. First time I used this, it fell inside the barrel. Hopefully I got a good tight there. Get my battery. So with the barrel now, as I was saying, it's very important when you put your uh, hose bib hole down on the bottom. You don't want it to rock. You don't want it to compromise. So what we're going to do is just lay it horizontal. Now, how do you access it? You got to make sure it's solid. The only way we figured out is just to throw your leg over it, kind of straddle it. Use your legs to keep it from rolling back and forth and find out where you're going to put your hole. And I'm going to pull this back up here. You don't want to put the the hole really low because a lot of people, hey, I want to capture that water. I want to get it. You don't want it low because if you took it off the cinder blocks, it would drag on the floor. You don't want all that weight on it. So you just kind of come up a little bit. So you have it a couple inch over. So that's about where we're going to drill up the hole and put it in. And you'll see how it drills easily, how it goes in there easily. It's real right. Claire, I think I better let you do this one. <laughs> and again, I don't want to go too low. I don't want it to drag on the ground. Let that whole saw do the work. You want to do the honors and put in that whole Sure, I'd we'll love to. She's going to, you'll see how it's a good fit right there. We got lots of tape on it here, as you guys can see. I'm just going to pop her in here. I'm good to knock. And we don't need the metal ones. We don't need the. I'm going to go ahead and rotate it in. It's such a good fit that it just basically threads itself in. That's that 25 millimeter, right, Mark? Yes, uh -huh. So I'm going to keep turning it until it feels good inside. Yeah, very good. Awesome. I love that. And we want to show you how easy it is. And again, when you buy a fully assembled kit, the uh, hose bar will be in, but not the bib. We want you to screw it in. We'll show you before you take it how it's uh, how it goes in, but you'll see it's really tight fit. And we never really in, had any problem. The only problems we had, people use it as a handle, transport, moving around. But we we're real happy with these hose bibs. We get them to True Value Hardware out in Grandview. Dave out there, we've been going to him for eight years. The more we buy, we get a little discount from him. But everybody thinks you need the hardware, you need the metal lines, you don't need all that. These work just well. Okay, I'll go ahead and screw in the top one we did so everybody can see how the fit is there. And here I kind of ran out of the white tape. We just used some black tape. It just needs to be a little thicker up here. But you can see, oh, that's a good tight fit. I got my left hand inside and I could feel it going inside. And I'll go about halfway in. You can see that's a very solid fit. That's a tight fit. Guys, very important. If you make your own, you got to have the right hole saws. Even if you the build type, you want to come and use our hole saws, we could probably do that. We'd rather sell you a fully assembled one, a discount one for 45 or one that's not marked for 65. But it's very important you have the right size hole saw. The right equipment. And again, everything was repurposed except these parts here. And uh We've never really had any problem with them. We've had some, um, like I was telling you, we had the two different size, the inch and a quarter and the inch and a half. We got 200 more the inch and a half. We decided to use them, but on our website, we tell people to get inch and a quarter. So we want to keep it constant, consistent and all. So I have covered the construction of everything on the barrel from the, um, from the, from the faucet, the hose bib, to the barb, how to put this in. And again, I'll just stress, these are a good benefit, these open top barrels. You can clean them out. As Claire said, you want to clean them out every year. You will get silt, you will get sediment in there. 
then we want you to put them once you uh, decide where you're going to put it on your house at downspell your downspell it's got the elbow goes all the way down to the ground okay now i've got to incorporate the rain barrel on there a lot of people kind of stop there oh i don't want to cut into my downspout i don't know if i could do it it's real simple to get it in there here's a little visual again right here that downspout went all the way down to the ground and once you put your barrel on top of your four cinder blocks then you know how high it is okay now i've got to cut it if your downspout came all the way down you don't want to cut it right on the top of your barrel you want to see how big your elbow is the elbow is usually about six inches or so maybe a little longer in length i would go up 12 i'd go up a foot from the top of your barrel again your barrels on top of four cinder blocks i would go up a foot then cut your down spot there and then everybody wonders what am i going to do with that excess piece one one way just keep it in your garage and um I think the rain barrel, if you ever sold your home, it would be a benefit for the next homeowners coming in having a rain barrel. You got all set up, but you can keep that down spout because some people may want to take it down, put it away for winter time. That's not really necessary. Just leave the barrel out all year. Just take out the kit, the, the thinner plastic flower pot, just take it indoors. They're you know, good all throughout the winter. We told you how thick it is. You might be able to see through the camera there, right there, how thick the barrel is. So they're a very durable plastic. It's not going to break on you. So um, it's on the four center blocks. You're going to make your cut. I'd probably go up a foot from where your barrel, the top of the barrel is. And again, the uh, elbows about six inches long. Then you'll it'll be about six inches up here. So what it's going to do, it's just going to kind of hover right above that hole and it'll fall in. And this one here is just a basic, this is just a basic um, downspout, the size, with the hole being on the center, the way it goes, falls right in there. You can see it, it's just perfect, it's just perfect. Sometimes instead of having it right in the middle, we just want you to go over here like a third of the hole so it's when the water does gushes out, make sure it all goes in there. But if it goes on top of the barrel, eventually it's gonna it's gonna fall in there. I don't want to mess up the tent, but now we're gonna make the cut into the uh, downspout. There's numerous ways. Some of you old schoolers have got the little saw at home. It's just simple. You can just get your downspout. You'll make your mark. Again, you'll go a foot up. You'll make your mark marker and just start cutting in there. It won't be this flexible, but once you get it started, you'll see it just cuts right in there. Or you could just, uh, Claire being so prepared, she brought her steel saw here. This is probably the way to go. Everybody's probably got one of these at home. And you can just cut right through that downspout and get it prepared. Now you've got to incorporate the um, the, the uh, elbow back onto there. And help me with the screw. What do you call it? A little setting screw? What you call it? Self-tapping screw, Self-tapping screw or something. That's what you're going to use to put it back in there. This one doesn't have one on there. It's a good fit. After a while, it may become loose. But just get a screw and put it in there, drill it in there, and hold it in there. Self tapping screw. We uh, made this one for our workshop, so we had a pump in it, a little sump pump hose, just to move the water around. But the sump pump hose buried inside my storage bin. But if you can, you can visualize that where the barrel is going to go in your yard, how to get the water into your barrel, how to get that cut with these tools. There's different ways to do it, but you're going to be, uh, you'll be satisfied. It's easy to cut that. It's easy to get it in there. Now we're going to kind of talk about aesthetics of the barrel. Like I said, some municipalities, they uh, may limit the number you get in or something, but everybody's got a home. Some may have a home that's kind of nicely manicured and 
some homes may have a fence around their property. You like that look at continuity, that elegance, that continuity consistent look. Whatever that fence is around your home, if it's a cedar fence, you make a cedar barrier around it. Put a little fence around your barrier of aesthetics. Keep that look of continuity. You can just make a little fence to put it around there. You can put some lines on there. That's better. Oh, you can put vines on there too. Sorry, just Mark. A warning there, huh? It is just a warning. You can put vines on the on a um, a mesh to cover it. You again, if you have that same native vine around your house, you can put vines around there. But this here is a real simple work here. Reed fencing, natural look. Get it at the hardware store. This is really a win-win. Sometimes it's not the right size for the barrel. But if you can just get it and kind of wrap it around your barrel, this is a good look. This is a good look, guys. It's not going to last as long. Yeah. It's doubled up, but we're just going to give you that look. This is a good natural look. This is another way you can kind of cover your barrels. Beachy vibe. <laughs> That's right. Or if you got some creative kids at home, you want to bond with the kids, you could paint them. We, uh, got to get the right kind of paint that's going to adhere to that plastic. There's different ways you could uh, kind of make that barrel a little more pleasing. But we've seen a lot. We've seen people put their rain barrels underneath their elevated porch. Mm -hmm. Numerous ones like you were talking about. I had one saw a picture. One guy had 10 barrels underneath. I think it made the news. One of the municipalities didn't like it. So he buried it. It, was, it worked out well for him. But there's different ways that you, and so many homeowners, they've got so many nice ideas how to capture that water, creative, more ideas than we thought, but we just kind of use this basic look for one. That's kind of how we incorporate the water into the barrels here. And I would encourage you guys, if you do get a, a rain barrel from Bridging the Gap, um, send us pictures of the, the after installation so we can see what you guys do with it. I mean, every project turns out a little bit different because there are so many little nuanced considerations you can make. Um, Absolutely. So I would say if you guys if you guys are willing, please send us pictures. I would certainly appreciate it. Yeah, yeah it's very encouraging. It kind of empowers me to look at it. Hey, we can do that look at this place or that design will work. Yeah. There's different ways you could divert that water into here. This is a, a diverter here. Everybody's seen the ones where at the hardware store. I never really haven't seen them, but you could turn it Turn it off once yep. the barrel's full. Then you can re-divert it somewhere else. Everybody has seen the plastic flex spouts, the downspouts. They can extend up to three, four feet. What we did in my house, I had the new roof put in, and the guy just went three quarters of the way down. And I wasn't for sure what size I was going to put in because I wanted to capture more water. So we uh, just left it there. And I had to go like a foot and a half from where it was stopped down into the barrel, that flex spout worked perfect. It worked perfect. Sometimes it's a little flimsy in the wind, and I just use a weight of a flat brick to kind of hold it down a little bit. Those flex spouts work really well. And if your downspout is not perfect on the corner of your house, then that's where Claire was saying, if you could show some designs and you decide to put the barrel two, three feet over here, sometimes those flex spouts can work. Yeah, send us your pictures, show us your ideas. You could kind of empower us how to get other ones done. But again, back to the aesthetics, you know, if it's not really a, a challenge in your neighborhood, but we want you to incorporate more and more and more. But that reed fencing is good, fence around your house. Keep that look at continuity. Native plants, good vine, all this be good. So when you're talking about putting two barrels together, I've got one here that's so this one here, everybody can see, we got overflow on both ends on the left and right. Because here, we're going to, we'll just act like it's going to my right here. You always want to, every barrel wants to have an overflow. Because you don't want that water, once it fills up, it's got to go somewhere. 
So this one's got two. We're going to add a second one in here. You can get some pump holes. You can get it cut. You can cut it in smaller pieces. Then you'll add your second barrel right next to it. This, we'll just put a big one there. That is a good question. Yeah, all the regular ones, the close top two is like a 55 gallon. Well, that one's small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And these are a little bigger. I think these are like 65 gallons. We looked and looked for the capacity on them. Yeah. And these are a little taller. These are a little bigger. I don't know if it's because these are flat on the top and this has got the lid where it's uh, a little taller, brings it taller. But still, it's even wider in the diameter. These are a lot. I think these are around 65 gallons right here. We were real excited to get these. And Claire and I and Mario talked about the other day, some families will want to put a design on it, decorative. Sometimes just putting that wrap around the barrel can look really nice. You could get it made in somewhere and let it keep or whatever, get it made, get that good design and put it on there. We, um, I live in the urban core here in Northeast. We we're trying to encourage people to um, be diverse, collect their rainwater, and found out a lot of people collect their rainwater at home, did more than I did, than we've done. But um, we had a red, white, and green uh, Mexican theme. We had barrels. And the red, I think you're not really supposed to use that, no telling what to come in it. But it was just more of an educational piece. We got the barrel clean and pretty good. But it was kind of a good, and a lot of people were, their eye was drawn to it. They really liked that. It was more of an educational piece. Speaking of educational, you can put a sign on there, contain the rain. Up catchphrases. Absolutely. I've got a quirky one, save your rain, don't let it drain. And Claire mentioned about all the water. You guys seen stories. You drove on highways. You seen the water accumulated on 35 highway. Just all these sewers get filled up. In my neighborhood at Ninth and Harder State, we painted a patriotic theme mural after 9-11. We enhanced it three years ago, but the railroad tracks are above it, and all the gravel's always falling down into the sewer, and uh, it's clogging it up. So it's just, and I let the city know it's a constant problem. We need to connect with the railroad. Hopefully no one's here who works with the railroad, but we finally got it where it's cleaned out on the continuous basis. These basins have to be cleaned. And as Claire said, that's why you want to keep as much water you can in your yard. She mentioned all the benefits. But once you start collecting, you'll see what we mean. But back to the designs, you know, you can put that educational sign on there. We put um, signs, we put it up at our church too, on the 275 gallon totes. We used the core glass screen. We had design on there for our church logo. People's eye was drawn to it. There's a lot of things you could do to make it educational aesthetically please mark we've got a couple more minutes here do we want to open it up to questions yes i'm glad we let's do it cool anybody have any questions for mark or uh follow-up questions Again, we've got the whole saws here. If someone wants to use them, come to us. We got them. All right. Can you ask about um, rain barrels? Can you pick them up from the Red Ridge location? Absolutely. Yep. So you yep. can. Uh, we ask that you purchase them online or request them online. You guys prefer that method? Yes. Correct? Yeah. Yep. So give us a heads up. We can have plenty made and transport out there. But online is probably best. But if you do show up at the recycle center, he will have plenty out in Red Bridge. Just bring a check. We don't want any cash. Just bring us a check made out to Bridging the Gap, the right price. And I'm glad that question was asked, too, because we haven't got the ones that are marred. It's kind of scratched, which is no big thing. We haven't got those transported out there. Okay. But let us know if you do it online. Well, that's a good question. Online, we don't have that link yet. We set don't. Up. Yep. Yeah. We'll have to modify yeah. the form a little bit but we can get you guys access to a kind of updated form to reflect those new prices yeah and if you want the ones for the 45 at the recycle center john out there will be he'll give them the heads up we'll have it just bring that check money order made out we really don't want any cash at the recycle center yeah and uh to that point now that 
Redbridge has a fence. I haven't been out there yet. We have a fence. We could probably incorporate more barrels there, even outdoors. They'll just have to be claimed for their transport. So, yes, you could, uh, we'd rather go online, but if you want to bring a check out there, money order, you can do that. Same with the other recycle centers. I'm at the one up north. I've got limited space. We'd rather go online there and make sure we've got plenty of room. I have a question. Do you recycle all the rain barrels? I have a rain barrel that is cracked and I want to get rid of it. Sure, sure. Yeah, we have, it's probably that durable plastic that we really can't take, but we can make an exception. We could discard it for you. If you're going to buy a barrel from us, just take it to one of the recycle centers. If you go to Redbridge and pick it up, We'll let John know he has a trash corral. We could get it. We just don't want a, a bunch of barrels because we're living in space, but we could take one or two that are cracked. And our, okay. Our site managers will know, but yeah, we could yeah. do that. Okay, problem. thank you. Uh, and I take it it was a pre-manufactured one that you had that's cracked? It's not, the, I didn't buy it from you. It was a gift. And oh. it's a different kind of barrel. Yeah. I've had it for over five years and it's cracked. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. If it's any of our products, if there's anything wrong with it, our barrels, bring it back to us. We'll get you a discount. And I'll share with John the story to him when you go when you go to pick it up. But if it's a compromise, if it's not satisfactory, bring it back, let us know. And we did have different designs at one time. The closed top, we had a whole top on bottom. We put fiberglass screen over the whole top. It wasn't durable. It wasn't a good design. We find out this is the better one. Yeah. Ken had another question um, about connecting rain barrels. You connect the overflow of the first to the overflow of the second. Yes. Um, so, yes, that is an option. I would say consideration there is do you want to fill up one rain barrel at a time in a sequence, or do you want them all to fill up at the same rate? So mm -hmm. if you want them to all, if you want them to fill up sequentially, you would connect the top to the next one, uh, to the top of the next one. However, if you want them to fill up all at the same time, you'd connect them on the bottom. On the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And again, like Claire was saying, people show us your designs. I have people do it that way, collect it from the bottom and the yep. water came up the same level on each one. You might want to do, if you're doing raised bed gardens, like that one example that we saw where, you know, you're kind of want to get, want equal water distribution throughout your barrels, um, that would be an option. Uh, but if you just wanted to fill up one at a time, then connect them by the top. And that's probably what I see most often. Yes. Oh, one sec. Scott, yeah, here's check it one more time. Guys, this is fun. Collect your rainwater. Once you get one, you're going to want a second one. But what's good, you can show your neighbors about it, how simple it is. And, and Claire mentioned all the benefits of the rainwater. You know, it's just win win. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your guys' time today. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm going to get this uh, recording not too edited, but I'll spend a little bit of time sprucing it up and then uh, I'll make that link available to everybody that signed up. Perfect. And we really encourage you guys to get some rain barrels. So if you haven't already, and congratulations on your projects that you're starting. Absolutely. It'll Send us pictures. Fun. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank Appreciate you, it. Sir. Thank you. We did it. <laughs> well, did I fumble and stumble a bit?